Hi guys, Dr. Gillard here again here. This is part two of the makeup lecture. Uh, date is 1-18-18, GIGU, winter 2018, week two. Here we go. Uh, Mallory Weiss tear. What in the world is a Mallory Weiss tear? Let's see what it is. Uh, AKA Mallory Weiss syndrome. So it's a cut, it's a laceration of the distal esophagus and it is almost always caused by someone who has chronic and severe vomiting and retching. What's retching? Retching is like the dry heaves. Uh, just there's nothing left to vomit. So alcoholics, right? Typically seen in alcoholics because of that. Uh, it can cause a severe bleeding sometimes and the bleeding is typically uh, hematemesis or hematinotic. So that would be like a bright red blood as opposed to a coffee ground uh, vomit or vomitus as should be say, said there, vomitus. And it's all, it can be seen in patients with a concomitant hiatal hernia. What's that mean? Con There's in our vocabulary word, concomitant. Uh, that means in addition to. So in addition to having this tear, you also have a hiatal hernia. The tear can also, especially in patients with these hiatal hernias, it can not only rip the distal esophagus, it can rip all the way down into the stomach. So you can imagine it can cause quite a bit of bleeding in these people. Some of the, one of the main risk factors is alcohol use. So about 25% of uh, cases are secondary to alcohol use or abuse, binge drinking in particular. Uh, um, so, so about 70, may, probably 75% because the 25%, let me see if I read my own slides here, 25% occur without cause. So idiopathic, we still don't understand it in other words, but alcohol is a big risk factor. Other risk factors uh, include patients with coagulopathies, uh, like factor V Leiden, people who have uh, clot too easily, uh, anti there are people who are on anticoagulants, people who have hiatal hernias are at risk for this tear, and the lesions uh, can become ulcerated. They can even perforate uh, and lead to peritonitis, which is very deadly, as we'll talk about uh, later on. That's only if the abdominal portion of the esophagus rips. Here's a nice example of what it looks like, a cartoon. So lower esophageal sphincters would be here. Uh, and there they are. They're small little Mallory Weiss tears. There's a real one. There's the endoscopic view of one. That thing, you can just imagine the patient's not happy because there's all sensory nerve endings in there, right? So lots of pain. Uh, these can result in hemorrhage, uh, uh, but they usually stop. They usually don't need treatment. Uh, you, it's like a binge night or binge, binge three or four days and you start bleeding, spitting up blood, uh, and they will typically heal. Some people, about 3% of people, go on uh, and it doesn't heal. It turns into a chronic bleeding situation to the point where they have to go down uh, and endoscopically uh, kind of coagulate the, kind of burn the tears together to stop to stop all the bleeding. 10% of all GI bleeds, uh, in fact, at the ER, uh, presenting as hematem hematemesis, 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 occurs secondary to a Mallory Weiss tear. Okay, let's go on to, this is a big one, Barrett's esophagus. Okay, uh, we'll do some physiology real quickly because this should all be review for you. Uh, let's do oh, a little pathophysiology, right? Uh, so metaplasia, what does metaplasia mean? That means when a native cell uh, is it's no longer in the region. It's been, it's morphed into a new type of cell. Uh, and the reason this occurs is because the native cell is experiencing some type of stress upon it. And after so much stress and inflammation, stress, inflammation, pretty soon the body just puts a, builds a better cell in there. So the old cell wasn't strong enough to handle the stress. Uh, 
typically it involves columnar cells morphing into squamous cells. A little different uh, in, in our case here, but that's that's kind of the typical thing. Here's the classic example of metaplasia. Someone who smokes, uh, they develop COPD. Uh, in the, uh, this is like a real a big time smoker. Uh, they develop COPD, which we'll learn is chronic bronchitis and asthma are both COPD. It's kind of a double double category. But their tracheal and bronchial uh, normally, or in the tracheal and bronchial, they would normally have ciliated columnar epithelium there. Uh, and because of the irritants to the to the to the the molecules in the cigarette smoke are causing such an irritation, they're actually replaced with stratified squamous epithelium to better withstand that type of, of stress. And unfortunately, they lose the cilia. So cilia, as we'll learn in CVP path, is important to sweep all that crud from the cigarette smoke and pollution out of your lungs. There's a mucus conveyor belt that we'll look at. Um, but you lose if you if you have metaplasia of that tissue, you no longer have cilia, so you're stuck with that stuff. And that's why smokers, uh, if you hear a smoker and they have a chronic hacking cough, it's because they've actually went uh, through metaplasia and they've lost their cilia. And then those metaplastic, what's the next sta stage beyond metaplasia? They can become dysplastic, and dysplastic cells are precancerous. You can consider them precancerous, and that's that's the deal there. So here's a patient uh, who is smoking. They, here's his normal cells, and here's where metaplasia has occurred, uh, where the simple columnar, there's the cilia that sweep the crud out of your bronchial tree and larynx, uh, and trachea. Uh, it's been changed, so it's been changed to better withstand the punishment of the cigarette particles. There's a real histological uh, view of it there. Okay, now let's get down to it. Uh, the dreaded Barrett's esophagus. Got to be high yield stuff. This is a big problem. So it's it's considered an acquired metaplastic condition of the distal esophagus. So the cells of the distal esophagus have morphed into something they're not supposed to be. Specifically, that normal epithelium of the distal esophagus, uh, which was stratified squamous, has now been converted into columnar epithelium, not ciliated either, just columnar epithelium. Uh, in fact, the same type of columnar epithelium that's seen uh, in the intestines. So that's not a good thing. And what causes it? It's believed to be caused by GERD. We talked about GERD already. That's a chronic reflex, a reflux of esophagus into the distal esophagus uh, because your lower esophageal sphincter is on the fritz. It's not working, right? It's supposed to stop stomach contents from bathing the distal esophagus, but it doesn't. Okay, so you get inflammation and cell damage over and over and over, and pretty soon uh, that same metaplastic process happens uh, and it causes squamous cells to become replaced by columnar cells, which are tougher. Okay, and books, if you read up on this thing, uh, books will say uh, that the distal esophagus has been intestinal, uh, intestinalized. And what they mean is that uh, metaplasia has occurred where the squamous has been converted into intestinal epithelium, which is simple columnar epithelium. Okay, so who cares about the, this metaplasia? Because it greatly increases the chances for a deadly type of cancer called esophageal adenocarcinoma. Uh, and when I, I'm, it doesn't like increase it by one or two fold or three or four fold, it increases it by 40 fold, up to 50 fold according to uh, the, the text in the Mayo Clinic that I have. Uh, so it's, a, it's, it's not a good thing. It has to be watched if you get a Barrett's esophagus. Biopsy makes the diagnosis. Go in there, take a piece of it, and see. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but the presence of, in the, in the intestine, not only are the columnar cells, but there's also goblet cells between the, the columnar cells. 
those are not supposed to be in the esophagus. So if you see goblet cells and columnar cells, uh, you have just got yourself a diagnosis of Barrett's esophagus. Okay, there's a cartoon of it. Uh, so patient with GERD here, uh, but now he's got a metaplasia. We got uh, the stomach's also columnar epithelium, right? It doesn't have mucus cells or it doesn't have goblet cells like that. Um, but uh, so this is just showing it. And the gastroesophageal junction or the Z line would be right, uh, normally would be here. So normally this is the meeting of the columnar epithelium of the stomach with the simple squamous simple stratified squamous I should say or stratified squamous not simple squamous stratified squamous just like your skin that's where this meets and you can see that this line is extended uh, much above the normal gastroesophageal junction we have slides on this too I think they call this the squamal columnar junction as well better not get ahead of my slides though here's an endoscopic view of this and you can see it doesn't look pretty like that one we saw. It's all lumpy bumpy. Uh, this this is all, uh, it's very easy to tell the difference between stratified squamous which is sm this pink and smooth pretty looking stuff and columnar is stains deeper or presents deeper red in endoscope, endoscopy. Um, so the, all this red stuff, that's all uh, metaplastic disease, that's all intest uh, simple squamous or simple columnar cells. Okay, there's a H and E stain of someone with this. Uh, there's a goblet cell right there. You don't see that in the stomach either. You only see that in the intestine. So this person's this is a section from the esophagus. They've been uh, intestinalized. That's a patient with Barrett's esophagus. Uh, some anatomy, recall the connection between the esophagus and the stomach is called the gastroesophageal junction. Sometimes they say it backwards, esophag esophageal gastric junction, I've heard, but usually gastro in this country anyway, gastroesophageal junction. Uh, also know that the junction between the normal stratified squamous epithelium and esophagus, or, or it's this is what it is, this, uh, this junction is called the Z-line, you probably know it as. Uh, that's also called the squamo-columnar junctions, AK. Uh, normally, that's right by the lower esophageal sphincters. Moving on up, so Barrett's es and Barrett's esophagus. You guys probably don't remember that. The Jeffersons, remember that one? Uh, they don't think they replay that anymore. You called everybody a jive turkey, the 70s thing here. Uh, th but that was moving on up. Part uh, anyway. Uh, so moving on up means the uh, the uh, Z line rises from its spot where it's normally supposed to be. That line uh, between normal stratified squamous of the esophagus and simple columnar of the metaplastic uh, region has moved on up. In fact, we there's two classifications for this. Uh, one's I mean, neither one of these are good, but one's really bad. The long segment Barrett's esophagus means that Z-line has displaced uh, quite a ways up, as we'll see in a minute. This, uh, I think it's three centimeters, we'll see in a minute. Uh, short esophagus means it hasn't moved up so far. So uh, the proximal displacement of the Z-line greater or less than three centimeters. So if it only an endoscope, if if the if the intestinalized tissue is only th up, or if it's less than three centimeters up uh, from the lower esophageal sphincters, or, or which are called the gastric folds, you can see where that junction is between the stomach and the esophagus endoscopically real easy. These folds come in, and that's where the Z line is supposed to be. So if the uh, if the doctor performing the endoscopy sees sees columnar tissue way above those folds, he knows this is a Barrett's esophagus. The only question is how far up or proximally does that extend? And if it extends less than three centimeters, diagnosis is short segment BE. If it's 15 centimeters, 
uh, or that's found in 15% of the people who have GERD. If it goes more than three centimeters, they have long segment BE, which doesn't bode well, increased risk for this to turn into uh, some type of uh, adenocarcinoma of the esophagus. This is only found in 4%, so it's a little more rare. Okay, here's kind of a cartoon of what I just tried to explain. So here's the stomach. This patient has a hernia, which is very common as well. Um, so the normal uh, Z line uh, would be, uh, I guess, in the specimen right here. Although that should, that, that I guess I shouldn't have used the slide. It was hard to find a picture of this though. Uh, but let's say this is where the normal stomach is here. Let's forget the hiatal hernia. Normally the Z line should be right here. Uh, so you can see this one. This is all the the simple columnar tissue. So this has been intestinalized. It goes way past this three centimeter mark. So this is long segment BE. If it just extends a little bit above the normal. Uh, the normal uh, Z line, which should be here. I just don't worry about the hiatal hernia. Uh, but then it's a short segment, it's not as bad. Okay, does that make sense? Uh, epidemiology so this is a disease of middle aged and older adults, very rare in children, almost non existent in kids under five. The average age of diagnosis is 55 likes Caucasians, very uncommon in blacks and Asian populations as well. And uh, if you do have BE, you have to watch it because every year 0.5% of the people diagnosed uh, will get it. So this is a yearly prevalence, 0.5% per year get it. Don't know what the lifetime prevalence is, but so 10% of the patients who have GERD symptoms, when they go in to check, you'll end up having a Barrett's esophagus and the doc will he won't say you have a Barrett's esophagus he'll say you have a precancerous condition in your esophagus and that's what it is uh, the chances for BE becoming cancerous uh, and that should be when I say cancer there's squamous cell there's two main types there's squamous cell and there is this uh, adenocarcinoma so is that, oops, that's the adenocarcinoma of the esophagus. Um, so the chance for B becoming, turning into adenocarcinoma, which is very dangerous, right? Uh, it increases uh, by more than sevenfold uh, over the past decade. So this whole problem is getting worse again, and we'll look at some reasons why. Well, here's one reason why right now kind of put this in ahead of time, but Americans and people in the West are becoming more obese. And since BE is strongly, strongly related to GERD, or your esophagus getting bathed in acid when it's not supposed to, if you have obesity, why do you think, why would that increase GERD? All that fat in your stomach increases the pressure on your stomach. It increases interabdominal pressure. And therefore, it helps stimulate or it encourages, if there's more pressure on your stomach, uh, it encourages acid to, to move upward. Remember, the thoracic, uh, pre the interthoracic pressure is negative. Uh, so that's like a sucking force to begin with. And now you get a pushing force because of all the extra belly fat. So increases GERD, increases B. You should definitely know this little relationship here. Uh, I think everything I just said, right? Obesity increases, blah, 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 blah. Central obesity seems to be even worse. Some people, especially guys, they get fat, they get the beer belly. That's even worse. It increases abdominal pressure even more. Some other associations. Uh, typically, patients have a long battle uh, with uh, acid exposure. So they've had GERD. They've been on PPIs a long time is typical. Uh, large hiatal hernias increase the chances. Uh, decrease pressure, so if their lower esophageal sphincter isn't working good, uh, that's a risk factor for the development. That means it's going to be getting bathed. Uh, motility problems, problems with peristalsis uh, can also increase the chances. 
and uh, decrease esophageal sensitivity reflex. Some patients get surprised when they get the diagnosis and they say, well, geez, I really don't have much problem. And some don't have any pain at all, yet they end up getting a precancerous esophagus. And just like I said, asymptomatic, approximately a third, 30% of BE patients have very few symptoms or the uh, if they do, the proton pump inhibitors they're on have made them almost asymptomatic, so it can be a little tricky sometimes. Uh, epidemiology, here's a Swiss study. A uh, thousand random people just underwent endoscopic examination, and 1.5% of the general population ended up having a Barrett's esophagus. That should be asymptomatic. So most of them are symptomatic. 2% were are symptomatic, 1.8%. It's pretty pretty close, about 50-50. So bottom line is you don't have to have symptoms to have a Barrett's esophagus. Here's a Minnesota autopsy study. I think this came from, uh, this is Mayo Clinic's book. Uh, there's a the Minnesota autopsy study in the 90s a huge number of people, uh, the prevalence of real long segment BE is what they looked at on autopsy was actually, and, and this was all on patients with stomach problems, uh, they found a 20 per, 20 fold higher incidence on real autopsy. So what does that mean? It means that endosco endoscopy is missing a lot of these diagnoses. The di doctors are going too fast, they're not paying attention. so prevalence might be even higher. What are some risk factors? The longer you've had the uh, the GERD symptoms, the more likely you are for it to become BE. I think we said that, didn't we? Uh, interesting, the severity of symptoms, again, are not related to the chances of having BE. Obesity is definitely a risk factor. Family history is a risk factor as well. So. Uh, so found in 7% of probands, remember that's the first person who has it, and first or second degree offspring. So there's definitely a family genetic type connection. I wonder if I, this is getting long, I didn't want to make these long. Uh, making the diagnosis, uh, to make the diagnosis you need two things. So on endos endoscopy, it has, has to be done to make the diagnosis. Uh, so you need to do the biopsy. Uh, and first of all, you need to be able to see the this, like I showed you, it's very easy to see the presence of columnar epithelium, which is extending above the lower esophageal sphincter. And then number two is goes to the histologist uh, or the pathologist, and you have to uh, you have to show evidence of columnar epithelium, but it must be evidence that it's hyperplastic. In other words, it has to have goblet cells in it. So this type of metaplasia has been called an intestinal metaplasia or, or specialized intestinal metaplasia or in specialized columnar epithelium. I like intestinal epithelium because stomach is columnar epithelium but it doesn't have goblet cells. It has to have goblet cells. Uh, the management's very similar to GERD. So antiacids uh, and aggressive antiacids to get it under control. Um, proton pump inhibitors, H2 blockers we talked about, so the whole nine yards there. Uh, fundoplication is not, they made a big deal about this, several of the texts I've read. Uh, fundoplication, remember that's where they kind of make the, the bun and hot dog, the fundus becomes the bun and they wrap it around and sew it, the fundus, around the distal esophagus to give it some more uh, beef to make it thicker. Uh, so it doesn't leak, kind of help that lower esophageal sphincter out. It's not recommended. If you have Barrett's esophagus, don't run out and get a fundoplication. It's not recommended. They've done a really good randomized controlled trial, actually, and it made no difference. But, here's the but, you got to have endoscopic evaluations, and I will tell you, these are not fun to have. I've had several of these, and they are not fun. Uh, the, every six months, if you have a low-grade metaplasia, so there's 
not too much cancer cells uh, but if there's a high-grade metaplasia every three months so they have to watch it like a hawk because it could become cancerous very quickly okay let's stop it right there uh, we'll tape three will be on esophageal carcinoma